Hi, I'm Max Kaiser, and this is the Kaiser Report. Boy, a lot's going on. Stacy Herbert, talk to me. Well, Max, I have the first headline here. Greenspan challenges critics to prove him wrong. Really? Tell me about Alan Greenspan. So this is him on Wall Street Journal. Your career, or, or at this point, almost reminds me somewhat of, of Brett Favre, who was America's best-loved quarterback, and now, in retrospect, his legacy looks somewhat targished, tarnished. And do you feel that that need to defend your legacy? What do you want to be remembered for? Well, I, my basic view is that uh, uh, you allow the facts to fall where they are. I have answered my critics. I've put the data out there, and I'm basically saying that if they can prove that I am wrong, that if my analysis of what the criticisms were are accurate, uh, which I think they are, then I would prefer that people change their minds. But if they prove I'm wrong, I'll change. I wish they would. He has bipolar disease. Here he is himself proving himself wrong. Were you wrong? Uh, Partially. In other words, your view of the world, your ideology was not right. It was that, not that, working. That is, it had a, that precisely. No, I, that's precisely the reason I was shocked because I had been going for 40 years or more with very considerable evidence that it was working exceptionally well. I want to go over some headlines because we, of course, are critics of Alan Greenspan. Mm, yes. And I want to go over some, just the headlines that prove him wrong. China safe official warns Fed monetary policies are creating inflationary bubbles, stimulate global FX intervention. So this is Liu Wei of China's State Administration of Foreign Exchange. And he said that the Fed's quantitative easing program may have some stimulus impact on the US in the short term, but also that it would add to global inflation pressure and fuel asset bubbles. Well, let me explain something to you, Stacey Herbert, about the global financial situation. You see, you've got the central banks, you've got the commercial banks, you've got the global banking system as it is. And this system is held together by various financial transference mechanisms, trading, markets that goes on. In 2008, it broke. And since 2008, central banks have been flooding the globe with credit. But because the basic plumbing of the global finance is broken, the credit that they are expanding with goes into two places. Number one, paper derivatives that are driving the cost of food higher, and paper uh, credit default swaps that are crashing the European bond market. So people say, well, is it inflation or deflation? It's, it's neither inflation or deflation. It's a busted global finance system that the central banks are responding to by flooding with more credit which is going into the derivative market in such a way as to force food prices in India higher and bond prices, derivatives, credit default swaps in Europe lower. That should be plain to anyone watching this thing. You've entered a Bermuda Triangle. So it's what you might call schizoflation or psychoflation? It's psych psychoflation. It's schizoflation. It's a Bermuda Triangle. Oh, it's a Bermudaflation. Well, it's broken. See, that's my point, Stacey Herbert. The system is broken. But you see, Ben Bernanke can't get up and say, oh, the system's broken. We need to fix the system because, because it would mean that, well, who broke the system? Well, Bernanke broke the system, and Alan Greenspan broke the system, and they don't want to admit that they broke the system. But you know what? You broke it. You own it. Yes, but perhaps Alan Greenspan is admitting it. We don't know. He speaks in Fed speak. And remember, that's all code. So always after the fact, he could say, well, that's what I meant by those code words I used. Yeah, well, yeah, so that's right. He, he does speak in, in Fed speak. Another term for that would be he lies. <laughs> he speaketh out of both sides of mouth. Here's an example in this next headline of inflation. Chen Teotl's pricier feast. So rising maize prices could force the price of tortillas up by 50%. Maize remains central to Mexicans' diets. Each of them gets through 90 kilos of tortillas a year. We've seen this movie before, Stacey Herbert. In 2008, there was a huge spike in paper commodity prices that caused all kinds of dislocation. Again, 
This has nothing to do with the uh, sound policies that should be implemented to encourage equilibrium in the system. This is a broken banking system. And the more that they, that they flood the system with credit, thinking that's going to help, the worse the situation becomes. Well, that's exactly correct. And Alan Greenspan, as we were reporting at the top of the show, he is saying that you know, his policies of trickle down, basically flood, give the bankers as much money as they need and it will trickle down to everybody else. What we're seeing is the exact opposite. All that's trickling down to the people is inflation on the ground and asset prices going out of control while wages remain the same. Well, paper inflation, so food prices in India, they're not going up because the demand for food in India is going up. Mexico. Or Mexico either. It's, it's anywhere you see price food inflation, it's because the derivatives that trade inflation are being fueled by Bernanke. Same thing in Europe. The reason you see bond prices crashing is that the credit default swaps fed by all this fiat currency and credit being flooded into the system is forcing traders to speculate more on crashing bond prices. And the other important consequence of this inflation to note is in the phrase common among Mexicans is called sin maize. No hay país. Sin mes, no país. What? Without corn, there is no country. Without corn, there's nothing, man. There's nothing without corn. So we're going to see that in this next headline. Deepening crisis traps America's have-nots. So the U.S. is drifting from a financial crisis to a deeper and more insidious social crisis, says the Telegraph in the U.K. And to this, they point out the economic, num the actual sales numbers. Sales of Cadillac cars have jumped 35%. Porsche sales are up 29%. Cartier and Louis Vuitton have helped boost the luxury goods stock index by almost 50% since October. In the meantime, down below where the poor people then bottom 99% shop, Best Buy, Target, and Walmart have languished. That's right. Uh, again, this is the result of a broken financial system. Let me give you the, the analogy of when your water main in your town breaks and you look out your window and the street is flooded with water, but you can't get any water on in, in your tap. Okay? This is exactly what's going on. The system is being flooded with credit at the top end with paper asset speculation and paper commodity inflation, paper futures speculation, which creates the collateral for the people who are manipulating and benefiting from this situation to go out and buy Louis Vuitton stuff. Meanwhile, other people can't get anything at the top because it's broken and they're experiencing quote unquote deflation. But it's caused, both the deflation and the inflation are caused by the exact same thing, a broken plumbing at the global financial level, which is like a water main break. This is a central bank mechanism break that has affected the entire global banking system is effectively broken since Lehman collapsed in 2008. We're living on borrowed time. The system is completely frickin' broken. And none, no central banker, no government policymakers, no leader in America, anywhere in the world, is stepping up to the plate and saying, the system is broken, we need to fundamentally fix. The only guy who could have fixed the system is Paul Volcker, and he's being asked to leave. So the article goes on to point out that 14% of the population in America is on food stamps. The U.S. Conference of Mayors is reporting that visits to soup kitchens are up 24% this year. The Telegraph says, such is the blighted fruit of Federal Reserve policy. The Fed no longer even denies that the purpose of its latest blast of bond purchases, or QE2, is to drive up Wall Street, perhaps because it has so signally failed to achieve its other purpose of driving down borrowing costs. Look, getting back to my water main break analogy, the people who are being flooded by the problem are repackaging the water and marking it up in price and selling it to the people who are now running out of water. They're taking advantage of the situation that's fundamentally cracked and broken. And Wall Street, is this is what they're doing, and in the city of London as well. System crashed, and they're making a market like side bets, like you find in any kind of disaster zone where suddenly the price of water skyrockets in the disaster zones all over the world when a disaster strikes. Here, the banking disaster has given folks like Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan and Wall Street banks, they're taking advantage of the situation, reselling water or credit or money or liquidity that should be reasonably priced, guaranteed as part of an equitable market, and they are making a killing, literally, because now people are dying in the street. Well, you mentioned that Paul Volcker was ousted. The headline reads, the truth comes out. Paul Volcker was forced out because the White House is going more pro-business. And we know what pro-business means now, uh, nowadays, and that means massive monetary inflation that helps them and destroys 
the purchasing power and the quality of life for the bottom 99%. Volcker, known for taming inflation in the 1980s, was disappointed with the way his advisory group became a public relations tool for the White House, as his meetings with the president were televised live, making honest discussion difficult to conduct, the person familiar with his views said. Yeah, the phrase pro-business is code for corporate pro-genocide. Well, you have to remember, they're in Fed speak. Everything is Fed speak. It's all code to communicate something just to these insiders while actually, you know, confusing the rest of the population. That brings me to this final headline, cash for gold offer bolsters H&T. And this is in the United Kingdom. And the, um, this pawnbroker in the UK, their profits are soaring. Their margins are now about 30%. And the reason is because there's been stunning gold purchasing volumes going on. People are turning in their gold for cash. Yeah, ransack the proles at the bottom, suckers. Of course, at the top, it'll be reversed. You won't really have the signal that gold or silver has reached the top of their price action until the reverse is true, until you start to see people hawking uh, gold and silver uh, on TV in this way and uh, in the, uh, the ghettos, uh, as we see it now. We have a video that came in, actually, Max, from the ghetto, and this is from Big B. Kell, and he's responding to a flyer who he received asking for um, him to send their gold for cash. Yeah, let's watch this video. This guy is on the ball. Well, before I show you the contents of what's in here, let's show you something else. Look what also came in the mail today. This little brochure, this little worthless brochure came to me from some little small hat, some little small hat operation out of Baltimore that's called Precious Metal Liquidators, trying to hoodwink me into giving up my gold, silver, and precious metals for worthless cash. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I want to send this right here back to them with a letter attached telling them to kiss my That's what I'm going to do. All righty. Stacey Herbert, thanks so much again for being on the Kaiser Report. Thank you, Max. When we come back, much more, so don't go away. in science and technology from around Russia. We've got the future covered. Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. Time now to go to Denver and talk with Steve Keen. Steve Keen is a professor of finance and economics in Australia. He's also the author of Debunking Economics and blogs at DebtDeflation.com. Steve Keen, you're usually in Australia. Today you're in Denver. Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. Thanks, Max. It's uh, great to be back on with you again. So what brings you to Denver? Well, I've actually thought I could think of the, the title of an old uh, Tom Hanks movie to say what I'm doing here. You know, the old Sleepless in Seattle. I've been down and enjoying Clueless in Denver. Oh, I think there was a, a, a movie called Eight Things to Do When You're Dead in Denver. <laughs> well, nine of the ninth of them is to go to the American Economic Association annual conference, which is what I've just done. So I gave a, a session uh, with a lot of informed people about why the crisis occurred and whether it's over yet. And then I just said to a lot of, uh, pardon the expression, but economic morons, uh, not even being aware that there was a crisis. And neoclassical economics always began from the belief that capitalism is fundamentally stable, is almost, they actually presume it always occurs in, in uh, has its behavior in equilibrium. And they continue to think that way after a financial crisis, but made it extremely obvious that that's not the case. And so what I did was go along to a number of sessions where neoclassical economists were either giving their ideas about what caused the crisis uh, and in fact that they had no cause whatsoever uh, or where they were saying would they change the way they thought uh, because of the crisis and the fundamental answer was no. Uh, so that to me was uh, just not, not remarkable. I'm wearing a t-shirt which says it all so if I can pop up on the screen I'll show you the t-shirt. Let's hope it works well on the camera. 
This is a quote from Keynes back in uh, 1936 when he wrote the general theory, which none of these guys have read, even if they call themselves Keynesian. And what it says is that, as you can read it, I'll say it out loud, the difficulty lies not in the new ideas, but escaping from the old ones. And Keynes continues, a bit longer than a t-shirt can handle, to say that ramify, for those of us who have been brought up thinking this way, into every corner of our minds. And that was clearly the case of the neoclassical economists at this conference. All right. Now, when I listen to you speak, I, I think a little bit about Jim Rickards. I don't know if you follow Jim Rickards' work or not, but he is also calls himself a systems analyst, and he looks at e economics as a, a systems in a way you uh, look at various um, systems. Uh, to, uh, you know, that's the best word for it. And engineering uh, is that—that's the basis of engineering these days. So, a, a, a seven four seven is a system. Now, one economist that seems to have gotten it is Hyman Minsky. Uh, talk a little bit about Minsky and, our, and the Minsky moment, what that means, and are we at one of those moments? We've been in one of the, we've, we've been in, not in the moment, I think we call the, you might call it not the Minsky moment, but closer to the Minsky millennia, because Minsky talked about a series of financial cycles, each of which led to the economy having a higher level of debt at the end of the cycle than it had at the beginning, leading ultimately to one where there's so much debt in the system that it collapses under its own weight. In, unable to finance the debt, and that's exactly where we are. So I, that's been my whole theoretical area, as you know, Max, modeling Minsky's hypothesis, putting it in a mathematical form, which then puts it in the same form that Ricard's work. It's fundamentally a systems, systems uh, engineering model of uh, the, the economy. And yes, it does have those characteristics. And you can't predict the future in this, even though you can say what's uh, likely to happen. And when I look at it, I can say we're certainly in the, in the regime where a, a Minsky breakdown is going to occur. And that's why I came out publicly in 2005, late 2005, and said, we're in for the biggest crisis of all time. Brace yourselves. And of course, the neoclassical economists who live in this world where they see the system always being in equal, equilibrium, and if it ever gets shocked, returning to equilibrium, they were simply incapable of seeing this happen. Okay, now, the neoclassical economists and uh, the uh, typical way that economics is being reported in the mainstream press, it works if you don't include the debt. And what's key here is that the debt that you talk about building up over years, for the most part, is held off the balance sheet and is invisible to some degree because interest rates have been trending lower and have been kept low recently in the last couple of years through the machinations of the central banking system. But this huge off-balance sheet debt pile, which no one really knows exactly what the size of it is, estimates come from, are from five trillion to 20 trillion, eclipsing, in fact, the size of the visible economy. But this, this is where a lot of this uh, the the, the uh, permutations and the subtle convolutions of unpredictability are occurring and now they're bleeding in to the system in terms of these sudden crashes and flash crashes and economic events. But it's, most of it's held off the balance sheet. Is there any way to get policymakers to force the banks to be transparent about the trillions of dollars that they're not disclosing? Well, uh, Max, I'd, I'd actually say that the visible stuff is far and away large enough to cause a crisis. And uh, the, the visible stuff in America's case, in terms of the private sector's debt level, peaked at uh, three, just under 300% of its GDP and has now fallen to 270% of its GDP. That's the, on the books. Uh, so that alone was enough to cause the crisis. And not the, the reason that the neoclassicals didn't see this coming fundamentally is they do not include private debt in their modelling at all. Uh, so they don't even have the, 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 what you might call an omitted variable problem. That they haven't got the right variables in their equations, even and their equations themselves are wrong. But that stuff off the balance books is vital because it's always worse than the recorded numbers. This is what people like Bill Black are uh, brilliant at finding out. And you go back and do your forensics later, you find that there's so much lying and fraud going on, and fundamentally putting stuff off the balance sheets is legal fraud. Uh, that that amplifies and makes the situation worse than the recorded numbers tell you. Now, the only way to get the banks to record that on the books is after the banks have already completely collapsed. And, of course, if you keep on trying to prop the banks up, what they're doing is a bit like the situation of the Greek economy, which, of course, they, they were helped in their mendaciousness by Goldman Sachs. 
uh, they are saying, oh, no, we're fine. This is our level of debt. We can cope with this. And, of course, it's not their level of debt. They continue going down. You try to revive them based on what they're, you're t they're telling you is their problem. They continue collapsing. And only finally after they really collapse, you see just how much they're carrying. Of course, in the meantime, they've accumulated yet more debt. So by de denying reality, which is the, I think they could call that the, the uh, true profession of central bankers, by denying reality, you make the ultimate reality worse. Okay, so just to uh, review, the, uh, the actual debt uh, in the U.S. is not the roughly w almost 100% that they talk about when they raise the debt ceiling to $14 trillion, and this is equaling one-to-one -one the GDP, but it's closer to 400% if you include private debt, corporate debt. But I want to move on to Australia for a second. Now, when you look at things like the floods that are going on in Australia, Steve Keen, which are expected to cost billions of dollars uh, as it shuts down the mining industry, uh, what sort of impact does this have on a highly leveraged economy like Australia? When you're highly leveraged, you're, you're very fragile. And therefore, uh, a simple shock that you could easily handle when you're in a robust situation becomes one that can knock you over the edge. Now, I'm not saying that the floods will do that, but I think it's, it's looking like Australia's getting close to a perfect storm because all the things that managed to make us shine through the crisis itself are now turning in the other direction. And the floods are really one of those classic exogenous events. Economists like to say that every every cyclical movement, every every deviation from equilibrium is caused by an exogenous event. That's nonsense. The system has endogenous instability to it. But of course, if you're endogenously unstable and you're near the edge, and then something truly exogenous like these floods, and because the floods weren't caused by the economy, come in and whack you, then bang, you can suddenly go from uh, looking like a marathon athlete to being in intensive care. But certainly that could be it's yet another factor which might make 2011 not the year of the Antipodes. All right, just to check in on the Australian housing market, uh, famously, uh, the housing market has resisted uh, the global deflationary pressures that have sunk the uh, housing market in the U.S. and other places uh, because the, the government in Australia, of course, came in with a huge subsidy package to keep it afloat. Uh, and given the current stress now with the, um, the environmental impact, um, where are we in the housing in Australia market uh, at, the, at this time? Is it still um, hanging in there or has it started to turn or is it going to shock everybody and just continue to go higher? No, it's kind of started to turn. It's quite amusing watching the change in rhetoric by the uh, property spruikers down here, always their property, uh, rather down there, since I'm currently in Denver, uh, always saying the house prices always rise. Now they're starting to say, oh, they might fall. They might not rise as quickly. Uh, they won't, The classic you know, Irving Fisher, house prices reach what appear to have been, appears to be a permanently high plateau. That's, that's pretty much summarizing what they're saying. The stats are saying something different. Uh, when that boost, when the government was taken out of this, the scheme, they, they, they called it the first home owner boost when they doubled the amount of money they gave uh, to, to prospective buyers to buy an established house from 7,000 Australian dollars, which is roughly 7,000 US these days, to 14,000 Australian and 21,000 for somebody buying a new place. That reignited the property bubble that was starting to burst back in 2008. And uh, house prices rose 20% pretty much in one year. And they're all saying, of course, there's no bubble. Well, the government helped cause the bubble, and of course, the financial sector funded the bubble. So mortgage debt rose by another 6% of GDP to be even higher as a proportion of GDP than America. Now the prices are turning the other way. So the first quarter after the um, uh, first home vendors scheme, as I call it, because the vendors got the money, not the buyers, uh, after that expired, house prices rose by 5%. They're about, about 3% this quarter after that. 2% uh, the last quarter, 0.1% up, and that's only because Melbourne, with the, the city still had a bubble going on, the other capital cities in Australia all had negative, about minus 2%. And now the news is coming through that when the next set of figures come out on the beginning of February, we should see a negative figure for the Australian housing market as a whole. And ironically, that's probably the worst in the mining states. Perth and Brisbane are doing far worse, it seems than the rest of the country, even though they're supposedly benefiting from the China stimulus. So the housing market in Australia is finally coming off the boil, and I don't think the government can turn off the oven and uh, the, the stove once more. So in Australia, the environment is proving to folks that it's unpredictable, that oh, yeah. environmental uh, catastrophes happen in ways that you cannot fully be prepared for due to the fact that the environment is part of a huge, uh, unstable system. Now, in economics, and of course, going back to Adam Smith, he drew a lot of his inspiration from observing nature when he wrote 
wow. wealth of nations and during the Enlightenment, which brought us neoclassical economics to begin with, it seems to have been ignored, but he looked at nature and he said, systems need to be mimicked in a certain way. So he, they mimicked the systems, except the part about the fact that they're highly unpredictable because these are very fluid systems. So folks are in denial about the ecology, they're in denial about the economy. My last question is, um, if you were to do an arbitrage between denial in Australia and denial in America, now that you've been in Denver a little bit, where is the denial deepest about the e ecological economic disasters ver and the ecological economic disasters in Australia? Which population is deeper in denial? Oh, Australia, without a doubt. I mean, America is truly in a depression. Let's stop. Let's, let's start calling it what it is, mate. As you, you and I both know, the real rate of unemployment in America is closer to 17% than it is to the recorded number because when somebody stops looking for work, the U3 measure America publishes its actual unemployment rate to drop them off the list. That's why they fell from 9.8 to 9.4% most recently. So about one in, se one in six Americans is out of a job. And the, the mood over here is depressed. Even the economists have got some realization of that. Uh, in Australia, it's still happy days. And this, uh, what really the reason Australia avoided the crisis was by recreating the conditions that caused it in the first place. They restarted a housing bubble, a debt financed housing bubble. But they're still thinking happy days are here again and are never going to go away. And most of the talk in Australia is about how we handle an expected 20 years of continuous prosperity. So as who's in denial? It's definitely Australia. All right, Steve Keen, thanks so much for being on the Kaiser Report. Thank you. And that's going to do it for this edition of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. I want to thank my guest, Steve Keen. If you want to send me an email, please do so at kaiserreport at rttv.ru. Until next time, this is Max Kaiser saying bye, y'all.